So I welcome everybody to the third session um, for, this, uh, for today, uh, Lessons Learned uh, in Cancer Imaging uh, AI. We have uh, three excellent speakers, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Stefan Rienen, uh, from uh, Microsoft Research, uh, based in Cambridge. He's going to highlight for us the challenges of developing tools for tumor definition uh, and segmentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is always challenging being the first speaker in the afternoon. I understand that we had a very good meal. So I hope that I can get you excited about uh, the work that we are doing at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge has a long history of computer vision. Actually, we started uh, roughly about 20 years ago and we developed technologies for the gaming industry. So the project that I will discuss today with you is the project called Inner Eye. And that is, initially, it was based on the algorithms that we developed for the gaming industry. Uh, so the, the knowledge that we gathered there is now used to also do segmentation of 3D medical imaging. And that is what this project is all about. So let me focus a little bit on uh, the, the research itself. It is a research project. So it is not something that you can buy today or something like that. It is def definitely research in this stage. Um, and the whole purpose, like already discussed so many times this morning, is to assist medical experts. And that is really, really important from uh, a Microsoft perspective. We do not have the ambition to replace the job that you are doing right now. Instead, we would like to augment the skills that you have and make sure that you know, the boring tasks are done automatically as much as possible. And that is, I think, the main goal, the main driver of the project. Uh, it is all about segmentation. And of course, if you're talking about segmentation, you can do all these nice things that uh, were uh, as discussed this morning. So really starting with quantifying the things that you can see in your images. Microsoft is not um, a medical company, so we do not have the ambition to go to the market with a product out of what we are doing here with the research. Instead, you should really consider that as a kind of cloud service that we would like to make available for other partners, other commercial organizations out there. So um, it started all with, uh, within the space of radiation oncology, not radiology, but radiation oncology. And there is a reason for that. I mean, we are talking about machine learning. And uh, machine learning means that we need data, data that we can learn from. So, uh, and especially within radiation oncology, they have a lot of already segmented images. So that was a good starting point, I think, to, to, to start uh, with the work that we would like to do. So instead of doing the manual segmentation, like you can see here on the screen uh, behind me, uh, that is, is a process that we definitely would like to automate as much as we can. So I will give you now a short video, actually. It is not a live demo because I don't have my own machine here in front of me. It's a short video about the tool in action so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is an application that we have developed in our lab, uh, really as a reference application. And what you will see is that the application is able to deal with DICOM images, CT scans and MR scans. Uh, this is a normal MR scan, uh, sorry, CT scan from a patient already diagnosed with prostate cancer. We are not doing the diagnosis itself. The diagnosis is already done, this is for treatment. So uh, we are taking this image, we anonymize the image completely, we select the model that we are interested in, and then we will send over that image to the cloud. So all the voxels will be sent to the cloud, and uh, the cloud service, which is running in the data centers at the moment in the UK and in the US, will then start doing the segmentation, really by uh, analyzing the voxels and uh, calculate the probabilistic chance uh, for every single voxel if this is part of a certain organ or not. The example that I'm giving here is uh, specifically for prostate cancer, but we have developed at the moment uh, roughly about seven, eight different models uh, on CT scans and MR scans, eventually even with multiple modalities at the same time. So let's say for brain tumors that we take, um, let's say a T1 gadolinium together with a flare image, take both images together, of course, uh, co-registered images, and then we will get information coming from both uh, images. And while I was talking, we have got our segmentation information back. So you can see right now on the screen uh, how we have uh, segmented things like the rectum, the bladder, the femurs, 
and so on. So all the organs that people are interested in uh, for doing the treatment. Is this perfect? No, it isn't. As I've said before, we want that the specialist is always in control. So we do expect that he's checking the results of the machine learning. And if he is not happy with what he is seeing, uh, then he should do the necessary fix up before taking it to the next stage for radiation oncology that would be the dose calculation. Uh, so that is roughly the technology that uh, we have developed in the Cambridge lab uh, in the UK. <coughs> so I spoke about roughly seven models that we have. Um, and you can use these models in the different uh, areas, uh, different clinical areas. Uh, the PROSET model is maybe the most mature model that we have at the moment. Um, you have seen it in action, uh, but we are working also within uh, radiation oncology on models for um, uh, head and neck. We are working for interventional oncology on, um, um, so on models for specifically around the liver. Um, we are thinking also to do something in the, the space of surgery, so we, have, we are, have a public partnership with Intuitive Surgical. Uh, where we are working around partial nephrectomy. Uh, so really uh, the, the whole kidney segmentation, the arteries, those kind of things. Um, and then we are working also with uh, some collaborators around uh, brain tumors, uh, more in general. So this looks, to be honest, already quite interesting, having seven models uh, with the technology that we have at the moment. However, is this enough? Probably not. So, which brings me to the first challenge. And this is a slide uh, that I've copied from the American College of Radiology. Um, so let's be super clear about that. Having seven models is a good starting point, probably the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, reality is that we need much more. Uh, our project at the moment is focusing only on two modalities, so the CT scans and the MR scans. Uh, but there is so much that you can do with, um, you know, machine learning on medical images. And probably none of the companies out there will be able to tackle everything. That's super clear. So instead of, you know, uh, working with hospitals and really gathering all the information, gathering the data and trying to build as much models as we can, well, that is not our ambition as uh, Microsoft. Our goal is uh, to create a platform a platform that everybody could use, maybe upload their own images for their own thing that they would like to do with their own best practices, because delineation is an art, is something that I've heard before. Um, and based on that, uh, so based on that platform, they could create their own model. And if somebody wants to do segmentation of, let's say, uh, the meniscus in the, the knee, well, that might be possible, but we are not going to do that. But that is something that could be provided them by, with the platform. So we call that concept training as a service. Are we there? No, we are not. But that is our, you know, our North Star. That is what we would like to achieve with this project. So let's focus on a second challenge, training data. And more general, how can we get, uh, I would say, the, the required knowledge to create the things that we are doing? So we, are, we need to work a lot with uh, hospitals, uh, with medical centers who can keep us honest. Uh, Microsoft is not a clinic, we don't have an MRI scanner somewhere, so uh, we need to work, we need to collaborate with people. Um, and it was said already in the previous sessions, uh, ethics is critical. We want to be sure that all the data that we get from the medical centers is first of all fully de-identified. We don't want to recognize anything on these images which might identify the patient itself. We have to be sure that there is patient consent. So we ask the hospitals also to really push this project through their ethics committee and make sure that, you know, that the data that we get is fully, fully consented. It is really, really important for us. And the other thing that we want is uh, only uh, work with sufficient data rather than collecting as much data as we can for a certain pathology. That makes no sense. If we have enough, let's say, with 500 images, then we need only 500 images, and that's it. So that's the way that we are working with hospitals at the moment. Um, and um, so the, the guy that you can see here is uh, Raj Jena. He's a radiation oncologist in the Cambridge University Hospital. And I'm super thankful for uh, you know, the collaboration that we have with them already for several years. Um, so that is actually how the whole project started, with the communication between the hospital and Microsoft Research in Cambridge. But nowadays, we are working with partnerships around the globe. 
which is important. Uh, I mean, we have seen that the preparation of patients can be different in the different institutions. Uh, the, the people that we are working with in Seattle in the University Hospital of Washington, uh, well, for prostate cases, we have seen that they are using uh, fiducials, gold seats in the images for prostate cancer. In the beginning, our machine learning was not able to cope with these images because these artifacts were very bright and we didn't expect that. But now that we have created one model based on images coming from different centers, uh, taken from different uh, scanners uh, with different, you know, artifacts and so on, we see that the machine learning model becomes better and better. So diversity is important to create a really robust model. I cannot disclose all the names uh, that you can see here on the slides because we have MBAs with these uh, medical centers, but you can see some of the collaborators that we are working with. So third challenge, the machine learning itself. Is it enough to simply look to the voxels and then identify based on the voxel uh, which, uh, you know, uh, which organ we are uh, trying to identify, the answer is no. The example that you see here in front of you, uh, you know, you have two voxels with exactly the same parameters. So that is definitely not enough to really identify what we can do. Uh, we have also, you know, deformations, implants, uh, those kind of things, uh, noise, image noise, uh, different image resolution. So there's a lot that we need to do before that we even start with training the model. We have automated that as much as we can, of course. Um, and that is how we achieve better and better results. And probably this might surprise some of you. We are not using CNNs at the moment. We are using uh, decision trees and decision forests, which is a different technology. Uh, so, and then we take every single voxel, we look at that voxel, not in a single slice, but instead we are looking really around the voxel in three dimensions. And based on the location context that we have for that voxel, uh, we can identify that that voxel might be indeed part of the prostate. I mean, if you have two white areas surrounding the voxel that we are interested in, then we know that these are probably the femurs. So that must be something in the middle. So that is how we are working. Uh, we do that with decision trees and decision forests with multiple layers, and as such, we will improve over and over again the results, and we are getting then a better and better probabilistic chance for that particular voxel. So that is how the technology works, uh, roughly, in a nutshell. Do we get good results? The answer is, uh, you know, yes, fairly good results. I think the results are good enough to get people excited. And that's the whole thing. If you want that technology gets adopted, you have to make sure that the technology is good enough so that the people see the benefits. It makes no sense in having a machine learning model where you have to do, let's say, one hour fix up afterwards. Then nobody will use it, of course. I mean, and that is important. So we did some analysis and compared that with existing commercial tools out there who are doing segmentation, typically ABAS-based segmentation, Atlas-based auto-segmentation. And what we have seen is that the results for, um, let's say, the, the heart uh, structures like the femurs is quite good with all of the tools. The big difference where machine learning plays an important role, I think, is ex exactly for the soft tissues, the tissues like the prostate, the rectum, and so on where uh, our uh, segmentation tool can achieve a die score of uh, roughly 80, 85, up to 90%, right? while we are seeing that um, other uh, systems, commercially available tools out there, are achieving only 70% or even less, depends a little bit. I cannot disclose the names for obvious reasons, I think, but uh, it, is, it was definitely an interesting uh, study, and it is actually not with the latest model that we have worked uh, on. So the fourth challenge, and that is the clinical adoption. Uh, also something which was discussed this morning. How do we want to make sure that people are using the tools? You have seen the application. It is just a reference application. And the last thing that we want to do is putting that in your hands as yet another tool that you can put on, you know, side by side with all the other tools that you have already. So uh, we really try to identify partnerships with existing tools out there. People are really focused on a certain clinical workload. Uh, you know, people who have already proven that they are relevant in the market, that they have a very good solution for you, that you are using on a day-to-day -day basis. And we are trying them to convince, uh, to, to, we are trying to convince them to adopt our cloud service so that they can provide you with the right segmentation tools directly from the tools that you are using already today. 
that is also the only way that we can you know, uh, create impact in the different uh, areas that you can see here in front of you. Um, and segmentation is not only uh, of interest in radiation oncology and radiology, but uh, as I already said, uh, robot surgery, they're needed for surgery planning, surgery guidance, uh, so they are super interested. 3D printing for orthopedic surgery, uh, so segmentation is also something that they're using very, very frequent. And then a little bit outside of, of the, the um, uh, you know, the medical center area that is uh, all related to the life sciences, the pharma companies, uh, and especially the CROs, so the guys who are really doing their reading work for the pharma companies in the clinical trials. Also, these people are uh, really, really interested in, uh, you know, seeing what they can do with uh, quantitative uh, radiology, doing longitudinal trackings, trying to identify once that you have done the segmentation, um, you know, the, the different uh, uh, shape and so on of the, the tumors uh, or the disease that you are investigating, how things are evolving over time. The last challenge, it is a medical device. It is not just software, it is not just machine learning, it is a medical device. Medical device means that you need FDA clearance. Uh, and somehow this is not so easy. I mean, FDA at the moment is quite rigid. That means, um, you know, you can get clearance for something which is always reproducible. So probably the question that I get the most when I present uh, this project is, how are you dealing with uh, continuous learning? Machine learning is all about learning. So changing the models over time. Um, and at the moment, I'm very careful in how I say this, at the moment, FDA is not able to cope with that. So that means if you want to get clearance, it is for something which is fixed in time. And we have done that exercise. So in uh, December 2017, we have got clearance for a previous version of the prostate model uh, than the one that you saw, together with the application that you saw. So we know how to do it, but that is one specific moment in time. So if you improve the models, maybe implement a continuous learning system, we have an issue here at the moment. However, the good news is that FDA is changing uh, in that regard. They do understand that machine learning will become more and more important for medical devices. So they are working now on a proposal, a uh, proposal which is already, uh, in, I believe, available in draft, to adopt the concept of machine learning. Uh, and that would be a huge step forward. So of course, then you have to, to take into consideration the best practices around machine learning and so on. And based on that, you might be indeed able to, uh, in the future, to have a continuous learning mechanism also cleared through FDA, which is, I think, a really, really big step forward. With that, a final slide. This is the team that is working on the project at the moment. Uh, a passion team, a small team, uh, but super excited about the possibilities of uh, you know, uh, machine learning on medical images uh, in general. What you will see here as well is that it is a quite diverse team uh, with different backgrounds, uh, which is absolutely necessary to succeed. As you have seen with the challenges that I explained, it is not just about the technology. It is not just about the algorithm. There's much more that you have to cover. So thank you for your time. I hope that it was inspiring. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to have a one-to-one -one discussion maybe during the break. And then I can also show you the other models that we are working on. Thanks. Okay, so um, it's my pleasure to invite to the podium the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ulrich Bick from Charité, Berlin, uh, Germany. He's going to talk about computer-aided diagnosis lessons from the breast imaging. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, even trying to do the CH. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizers to bring me to Lisbon. It's my first time here, and I so far I enjoyed the meeting very much. So I'm kind of a dinosaur. I've worked with uh, CAD for more than 25 years, and I will um, give you some insight into um, the ups and downs of those 25 years. So uh, I'm a clinical breast imager. I'm a radiologist, and um, breast imaging, especially breast cancer screening is kind of the blueprint uh, for CAD. Uh, that's where all the initial uh, studies were done. So why do we do breast cancer screening? 
if you uh, look at a palpable abnormality here, um, it means about 30 to 50% of those women will die. If you find a cancer early here, uh, if it's a screen detected cancer, it's local disease, it's limited surgery, and more than 95% of women will survive. Uh, I will not go into controversies in terms of that some of those cancers we find are not really necessary to find, um, but that's a different topic. So if you talk about CAD and breast imaging, uh, you pretty much have to look at what you are talking about. Computer-aided diagnosis, this is kind of the royal discipline finding the cancers in asymptomatic women. Um, decision support systems, CADX, computer-based visualization, and then you have to talk about asymptomatic or diagnostic patients, and I'm concentrating on screening, computer-aided detection in mammography. And obviously, we now have ultrasound and MI, which we use in high-risk patients. So the task of a screening radiologist is not an easy one. If I go in the screening unit in the evening, I have 200 screening cases waiting for me. It's four images each patient, and only one out of those 200 will have cancer, okay? The low prevalence is actually a huge problem for the computer, too. So this is what I have to look at, and I have to find the cancer. This is the cancer here, um, and this here. So everything else looks exactly the same. So don't expect deep learning or any computer algorithm to be much better at that initially. So it's a difficult task. So once you find it, this is what we found and if you do spot compression or ultrasound, the diagnosis is easy once you have the localization information. So this is a typical screen detected cancer, an eight millimeter invasive breast carcinoma, um, curable disease. It's pretty much a non-event. If you find cancer at this stage, it's completely curable. So if you look at the traditional CAD approach, and I invite you to look at the time of the publication. This is 1987. So what the computers at that stage want, or the scientists wanted to do, they wanted to emulate how a radiologist makes a diagnosis. And microcalcification is one of the typical signs of breast cancer on a mammogram. So what they do is, this is the original image. You see a clustered group of calcifications which have a suspicious morphology, you do some image enhancement, you do feature extraction, and then you decide whether that cluster is really cluster. And this is kind of emulating how a radiologist would read the images. Um, this is from 2000. Uh, this is from the first commercial CAD system in breast imaging. This is from the initial application uh, during the dot-com boom, the first time computer boom uh, we had. So if you look at microcalcifications, the computer is very, very good in finding them. Uh, trying to beat the computer in finding calcifications, it's, it's really a tough um, challenge. But masses is a completely different ballgame, and we saw why, because the normal breast carampera looks like masses. So this is initially 75%, it has come up to 90% or something around, but it's not perfect. But I invite you to look at this here, at an average of four marks per normal case. So false positives are a huge issue, and I will come back to that. So why is this so different for calcifications and masses? So the detection of microcalcifications is difficult for the human because it's never thorough. He always thinks of something else. If you look at screening mammograms for two hours, you never 100% thorough. That's why we use two readers. Um, but it's easy for the computer. It's a perfect signal. I mean, you can decide whether there's a calcification or not. It's different for masses. They look very similar on some, I mean, a very many areas may mimic masses. So it, they are difficult to interpret both for humans and computers. And actually, the most difficult part is the associated architectural distortion 
Um, all the air grooves and have tremendous trouble with this. And this is a real case. We used CAD for a while in our system. Um, these are benign calcifications on the left side, which were picked up by the system. But this is the cancer. A subtle area of architectural distortion, some lines not behaving the way they should. And this is really, really tricky to pick up for the computer. So this slide is actually quite a few years old. So the definition of computer-aided diagnosis initially, and this is very, very important, is a diagnosis made by the radiologist taking into account the computer output as a second opinion. So in this case, there's no question who's responsible. It's the radiologist who's responsible, okay? And this is how it was easy for FDA to approve it because it's still a human diagnosis. And this is, again, 90-90 here. Um, this is what happens if you provide CAD to the radiologist. Um, this is the observer of performance without CAD, this line here, and the AZ improves. These are two specificity levels, and this is a real-life example. This is a small group of calcifications here uh, marked by the computer and you, you can see the increase in area under the curve by using the computer. But what's crucial, the traditional CAD systems are not a black box. So if I have a computer prompt, I can actually ask the computer, why did you put a prompt there? And he will show me the individual calcifications. And I can do a verification. If he puts a line on a vascular calcification, if he puts a dot on a, on a clip or something, I can even see, oh, he was misguided in this case. So, um, if you use CAD, it's additional detection. So, um, your callback rate increases and you find some additional cancers. But it depends on your individual experience, how big the difference in performance will be. And this is a large study here in 2004. Um, experienced readers, this is the detection rate, how many cancers per thousand reads you find. Um, without CAD and with CAD, actually it goes down a little bit, but no significant change for the experienced reader. For the inexperienced reader, you can see that the performance actually goes above of the experienced reader. So it's a completely different situation for the experienced or the inexperienced reader. And what happens? So the novice pretty much believes everything the computer says because he's not experienced. <laughs> so the expert never believes the computer. He always thinks he's better. So the key to work with CAD is to be somewhere in the middle. You have to have appropriate training um, to show that you can, how to use CAD and must include feedback on missed cases despite and false positives due to CAD. So this is very important that you have this training in place. So we heard already that um, those CAD applications in breast imaging were reimbursed starting early 2000, I think it was like 2003. It has been used for 10 years extensively in the US. Approximately 90% of breast imaging systems um, use CAD. And then we had a couple of publications which were really, really disappointing. So um, this is the Fenton study in 2007. The conclusion, the use of computer-aided detection is associated with reduced accuracy of interpretation of screening mammograms. You recall more but you're not better, okay? Um, Constanza Lehman, uh, experienced breast imager, um, several years later, 2015, screening performance was not improved with CAD on any metric assessed. So huge disappointing. I mean, the um, public payers and uh, the insurance companies paid for CADs for 10, 15 years, and there was no benefit to the patient. So they, we already heard about DEMIS trial. It's a, it's a trial in the US where they double exposed more than 50,000 women, um, film and digital mammography. And um, they had 
335 pathologically confirmed cancer cases, and they ran two different CAD systems, commercial systems. Sensitivity of the systems was 74% um, for digital, the radiologist at 43. So the computer finds a lot more cancer cases than the radiologist. Um, keep this in mind, false positive per case around two for both of the systems. So what happens if you give, give these systems to the radiologist? And this was published 2012. Um, this is the group using vendor A without CAD, area under the curve 0.71 with CAD 0.72. No benefit of using CAD, even though the performance on the database was better than the radiology by the computer. So what is the problem? Why it doesn't work? So you have to look at the performance scale of the radiologist and the computer. Um, and I talked about false positives per case. Remember, it's a low prevalence disease. I only have one cancer in 2,000 images. So if I am a radiologist, I have a positive predictive value of a prompt. If I say it's wrong, it's about 0.1 to 0.5, 10 to 50%. If I'm running at a average of one per normal case, my positive predictive value in the screening setting is 0.005. So it's quite a bit different from what the human being does. And that is why it's so difficult for the radiologist to use the computer output, because it's on a completely different system. This is an interesting, you, you all know what a recall rate is? The recall rate is the number of cases you call positive if you, if you do screening. So if you allow yourself to recall more, any human being can find more cancers. And the key is to shift this to not recall more, but have a better sensitivity. But you combining a human reader who works here with a computer who works here, and that does not work, okay? And that's the problem why the conventional CAD and breast imaging has failed so far. So this is something um, I've been part of the CAS conference and we did tutorials on CAD for quite some, uh, some time with Kunia Doi and we showed this image. Um, so we expected continuing increase in computer power, large digital training databases, self-learning algorithms based on source data, not trying to emulate the human reading process. And that is something which is exactly happening now. You have deep leaning, learning which is not trying to emulate the human being, but finds the um, system itself. So taking the radiologist out of the equation would have to happen. But it's not without trouble, as we heard uh, during the day today. So data privacy issues, integration of computer output into clinical workflow, regular approval, and legal responsibility. Those are the two which we really have to look at. And deep learning is a black box, okay? So, and that's a trouble for a radiologist because the radiologist is not going to take responsibility for a black box. If he gets a number, he has to be sure that that number is correct. Otherwise, he won't use it. So if he get a number probability of malignancy, first of all, without location information, that's extremely dangerous. For example, there are blood tests out there that are currently marketed. If you, if you have a blood test saying you have breast cancer and all your imaging doesn't show you the cancer, you have a huge problem because you don't know whether it's too small to be found or if it's a false positive. So that's, that's a big issue. So the current regularity process uh, does not fit AI-based AI systems. We talked about that. We talked about the reproducibility aspect. Um, so if, this, if it's self-learning, it's not reproducible necessarily. AI-based systems may be legally required to provide explanations. We talked about that, that's very interesting. And for AI-based black box system, clinical trials assessing the entire treatment chain and patient outcomes will be required. 
This is completely different, and it takes 10 years and more to do that. That's extremely important to realize that. And again, radiomics is behind genomics, and genomics, we're already there. We have systems, and this is one of those trials. It's a 21 gene expression assay in breast cancer. And this actually re revolutionizes the way we treat breast cancer patients, because it will save chemotherapy to a large number of patients based on a number, based on a number of a gene expression area. And this will happen for radiomics too, but we need the studies and we need the, num the money to provide those studies. So in conclusion, traditional computer-aided detection schemes have failed to show a measurable benefit in terms of routine. Main reason probably lies in the inability of the human reader to efficiently incorporate the computer output and the new deep learning approaches may overcome this, but um, it may take longer than people expect. Thank you very much.